Sam Colt is certainly one of the more interesting personalities in the history of the United States, let alone firearms manufacturer. Obviously today he's, he's a household word due to the uh, patent of his revolving cylinder handgun from 1836. But uh, a few people really know the full story of Sam Colt and what a remarkable and colorful life he led. Samuel Colt is an interesting character. You know, prior to being involved in the firearms business, he came up involved in a bunch of bunch of schemes. One involved you know, trying to blow up a, an underwater mine, you know, in the Housatonic River, I think it was, and it was a complete bust. Probably his most successful other occupation prior to becoming the founder of the American Revolver was uh, he used to give ex exhibitions of laughing gas. Every time Dr. Colt, the purveyor of nitrous, would get enough money together, he'd go and pay these Baltimore gunsmiths to, to render his ideas in steel and wood. Uh, Colt wasn't actually a guy that sat down and uh, made the steel parts. That wasn't his role. He was the idea guy. In 1830, he was on board the U.S. brig uh, Corvo, uh, sailing from um, Boston to Calcutta. Supposedly, he was watching the Paul mechanism on uh, the ship's wheel, and he came up with the idea of the, the revolving pistol. Whether this is a true story or not is questionable. Some people think it was kind of hype put together by the Colt factory, and that Colt probably uh, saw a Collier revolver when the ship you know, laid over in, in London. Whatever the case may be, in 1836, he patented his first revolver. It was called the Patterson because it was made at Patterson, New Jersey. The guns that came out of the Patterson Falls factory in New Jersey are kind of neat. In fact, you know, we know Colt is a handgun guy, but the very first guns made at Patterson, New Jersey were, were long guns, you know, were Patterson rifles and carbines. There's a problem with such guns, though, uh, especially in this area where it's black powder and machine tolerances aren't even as good uh, as they would be at the Colt factory uh, a, a decade or so later. No, you have this concept called cylinder gap. And so you have a revolving cylinder, sometimes with an enclosed hammer, uh, later with external hammers. And so you use this ring to advance the cylinder. Uh, but when you actually fired it, you know, the hammer hits the primer. It detonates the powder charge and then the ball goes from the cylinder into the barrel. The problem is it's not perfectly aligned so you have expanding gas often shaved lead uh, going 360 from that jump into the barrel. So even though you have the Colt rifle and the Colt shotgun you can't hold them like a conventional rifle or shotgun of then or now because you have the danger of the gas and the lead spitting injuring the user. And most people don't realize that, you know, his patent was filed in 1836. He began work on it long before that and uh, had a number of working models uh, many years before the patent was filed. He was always short of money, needed investors, tapped every relative he had, just about everybody he could get his hands on, he, 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 he tried to get money from them uh, to help pay for the hours of uh, shop work that his gunsmiths were going through. Patterson is not unlike most of what came after uh, in the way of percussion revolvers from Colt. The unique factor about the, the handguns is that the, the trigger was a, a drop-down trigger, so the trigger fell when the gun was cocked. They didn't have loading levers on them at first. That was uh, something that came later. Uh, so you had to physically use a, a loading lever by dismantling the gun, removing a wedge, and then using the key slot and the cylinder pin uh, as a fulcrum to, to load the powder and ball into the gun. Caliber initially was in 28 caliber, and then later on he came up with a larger belt model in 36 caliber. An interesting gun. Ergonomically, it was not wonderful. If you've ever fired one, you'd have to have the hands of an orangutan to be able to actually cock it and work the folding trigger at the same time. So it, it was, it, it, it's almost a two-handed gun, really. It's Colt's name you know and remember because out of all the other failed inventions of revolving arms up until 1836, his is the one that stuck. His is the one that kept going. 
His is the one that, that we still, you know, obviously refer to today. And it's not just because his idea was better than others. It was Colt that knew how to market it. Most of Colt's guns had a look to them, and they were pleasing on the eye, you know. You lay an 1860 Army next to, a, you know, Webley and Scott, there's no contest on which one's sexier. So it, it, Colt's always had a good look to them, and then Patterson, you know, he started embellishing the guns right off the bat. The museum here gave a uh, national gold medal to a pair of engraved, cased, Patterson revolvers. That Colt gave to uh, Abraham Binninger in New York City to pay off his liquor tab. <laughs> Binninger imported London dry dock gin and Colt had quite a quite a bill racked up. And so uh, the, one of the world's most valuable pair of Pattersons went to pay off a liquor bill. When you're talking about Pattersons, they're, they're basically three guns based on their size. The smallest is a 28 caliber. Uh, this is the pocket model. Uh, then you move up to 31 caliber, and that is the belt model. And then you have the holster model in 36 caliber. Now these are all five shot guns. And when they say holster, they don't mean a belt holster, right? That's, that's the belt model. You put that gun on your belt. No, this is meant to go in holsters that go on your pommel. Patterson's had basically two shapes uh, to their stocks, to their grips. Uh, there's a fairly uh, straight one, and then also you end up with variations that have more of a, a Coke bottle look to them. The loading mechanism was a little bit awkward, and so eventually in 1839, they came out with, a, with a, an improved model that actually had an attached loading lever, and there was a cutout on the recoil shield so that you could put individual percussion caps on without using that percussion cap loader, which was a little wonky at best. But the, the gun itself was still delicate, slightly underpowered. However, Hayes really, really liked them, and uh, soldiers would uh, carry a brace of them. The problem is, is he is maybe a little ahead of his time with the Pattersons, and eventually he ends up absolutely bankrupt. The factory ends up being uh, run by a guy named Ehrlers, and actually guns are assembled at Patterson long after Colt had departed, and these are known as the Ehlers Pattersons. So the Patterson Colt was a, a great idea whose time hadn't come. That would change later on when circumstances like the California Gold Rush would occur at the exact same time Colt's you know, first viable product was on the market. But for the uh, Patterson, it might have been a, uh, a smashing success had the, the Gold Rush come 10 years earlier, but it didn't. And so Colt basically was out of business, out of the market. There was nothing there for him. And uh, except for debt, while Patterson found some success in, in Texas, uh, that was about the extent of it. 